A Vast é uma das principais empresas de segurança a nível mundial. São 230 milhões de pessoas utilizando as soluções de antivírus da empresa e isso significa quase 25% de toda, de toda a base mundial. A Avast também foi uma das primeiras empresas a utilizar essa questão, a trabalhar essa questão do antivírus gratuito para, as, para os computadores, para as pessoas. E isso tem é, definido um pouco a realidade do mundo da segurança. Para falar um pouco mais sobre isso, converso agora com o Andrei Vulcek, ele é o CEO da Avast a nível mundial. First of all, thanks for coming, Andrei. Thank you so much for inviting me. So, uh, you created you you created the first antivirus for Windows 95, right? So, how was it like to create an antivirus back then? I, I guess it's really different 20 years ago to create an antivirus antivirus then yeah. what it should be now. It was quite different, yes, because I mean, at these times we maybe had one or two or five viruses a day, while today we have like 200,000 new samples every day. So the approach that we took was totally different. But back then, it was mainly about kind of manually reversing and finding patterns, finding signatures. Today, it's really very much about statistical analysis. So we use big machines, we use server clusters to process that kind of data. For people to understand, at that moment, you used samples of virus, right? So when you, when you download or, or update your, up, or your antivirus, you are actually downloading samples of virus, right? We were, uh, when you updated the antivirus, you were downloading something that we call the signatures, which is uh -huh. basically like a fingerprint of the virus. But the samples we were kind of trading with our competitors. So there was a big exchange network for samples. Like Avast would trade with, I don't know, AVG and with Symantec and McAfee, etc. That's how, that's how the industry worked by then. We were basically kind of exchanging samples. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the community was an important part of it mm -hmm. as well, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Because there were people around the world who kind of volunteered to participate in the virus research. So they would help us. They would se be sending us samples. They would be helping us, etc. That's not really the case anymore. Mm -hmm. How is it like nowadays, I guess? You have like everything in real time, loads of engineers, uh, engineers like uh, seeing what's going on yeah. all around the world in real time. Well, our approach is to actually kind of try to do as much as many things kind of by machines as opposed to by engineers. So our virus lab, you would be actually surprised that the virus lab is relatively small. Our virus lab engineers work on automated systems that run in the cloud in the back end. So we have this big kind of uh, cloud data processing unit, which runs in nine different locations around the world. And that processes millions and millions of inputs that we basically receive every day from our sensors. So, I mean, besides the, I, I mentioned this 200,000 or 220,000 unique samples a day, but besides that, we have many more of other kind of suspicious uh, signals that we get from our sensors that need to be analyzed as well. And this is all done by machines. How is, uh, how, what's the difference now, uh, nowadays between the free version and the paid version? Who should pay for the antivirus? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the, our mantra has always been that our free version must be at least as good as our closest competitor's paid version because we really wanted to keep the quality of the free version very high. We don't believe in kind of crippling the free version because that won't give you the popularity, the distribution that you want. So the main difference today for us is that the premium versions have some kind of convenience features. So for example, we have a firewall in the paid version, we have anti-spam, we have uh, some privacy controls such as a data shredder that will allow you to kind of delete da data, delete files for good. And uh, more like, I mean, other convenience features, but it's not really about the core functionality, which is protection against viruses. This is identical across all the product. Mm -hmm. As we were talking before start recording, you're talking about a new functionality on the 2016 version, which is a built-in password manager. You always say, you always tell people, you always advise people to use different passwords for different uh, services, but nobody does it mm -hmm. besides of you guys that work with security, right? Right. But how, how to do it in a, in a good way or in an easy way to remember, how to remember every single password in our mm -hmm. lives? Yeah, so you, I, I don't think you can do it kind of manually. You need tools, you need good tools for that. Tools that are not only secure, but they are also convenient to use. So people won't use tools that are difficult to use or are user unfriendly. So that's why we really kind of started this project of the password manager. We felt like most of the tools that are in the market today are just too difficult to use or are just kind of very inaccessible. So people don't even know about them. 
So we felt like if we integrate a full-featured user-friendly password manager into our core antivirus product, people will start using it. And then, of course, the overall security situation on the internet will get better. What do you think that are the things that people always do nowadays they shouldn't do? I mean, like password one is one of them. Maybe connecting to uh, public Wi-Fi or mm -hmm. what would you say, like, don't do it? Yeah, sure. So there's a couple of things. Uh, maybe talking specifically about mobile devices because these are kind of the emerging trend here. Uh, one thing, of course, you need to kind of make sure that the physical access to the device is somehow protected. So you should use at least some kind of uh, pin code or some kind of pattern when unlocking the device. It was actually quite a shock for me that when we ran a survey, we found that 61% of Brazilians don't do it. So only 39%. 0.5% of the Brazilians are worried about that, but they don't do anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's a big disconnect uh. between what people think they should be doing and what they are actually doing. So in this case, over 90% of people thought that, I mean, they really need to protect their devices, but only 39% of them are actually doing something. And that was a really funny thing on that, that survey as well, because you found out that people don't want in the first place, people don't want their, their spouses or their, uh, their partners yeah, to, exactly, to see yeah. the things. You, normally, you would expect, at least I yeah. would expect, to, I mean, the, the top, top spot to be taken by some kind of hackers or cyber criminals or something. But actually, what, what, what came out from the survey is that the number one person or uh, individual that people don't want to s access their phones is their partner. And the first app? It's WhatsApp. The, the first, yeah, it's protected. Not data is not yeah, like it's not contacts, banking. It's, it's banking. not shopping. No, that's no, no. WhatsApp. I don't want anybody to see my WhatsApp talks. Uh, right. right. So back to the consumer side. Uh, what would you say for people? That the same question. What would you say for people they not do? Uh, yeah, sure. They shouldn't do. Yeah. Right? So the other thing is uh, public hotspots. So there is a big increase, big boom in public hotspots. I think that's mainly because. Uh, the, the operators, the network carriers, often kind of have very, very low data plan, data limits. So let's say one gig, two gig a, a month uh, is not unusual. And that's, that's very little. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, one video, like streaming of one video is probably one to two gigs. So it's really only one video a month, which is just, I mean, not enough for most consumers. So what people do is use public hotspots to get access to the internet, like relatively broadband access. So they would go out, I mean, use I mean, hotspots at Starbucks or at McDonald's, et cetera, which is convenient and it's okay. free and it's open. And open means that it doesn't require any password, mm -hmm. which is very convenient, of course. But on the flip side, the danger in that is that by not requiring a password, that means basically that the, that the hotspot doesn't encrypt the data in any way. So if you are browsing on that hotspot, anyone else connected to the same network can actually see everything that you are doing. People don't realize that, but that's actually what's happening. So if I go to a banking site, people around me will see I go to a banking site. If I go to Facebook, to, 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 to WhatsApp, etc., people will see what I'm doing. And then, of course, it's just one step away from being able to somehow break into this traffic to modify, for example, the banking transaction, etc. And it's actually, I mean, this is happening all the time. I mean, it's not like theoretical thing that would be just kind of somehow, mm -hmm. um, uh, somehow in our head. This is, this is happening yeah. in the wild. Uh, do you recommend any browser? Or? Well, so Avast, as in general, of all the desktop browsers, recommends Google Chrome because we found it the best balance between kind of convenience, security, and, and ease of use. But um, I mean, I, I would say today, most of the browsers have become relatively uh, comparable in terms of security. Um, so it's more kind of a convenience thing for people. Okay. We use Google Chrome. Great. Okay, Windows, Apple, Android, iOS, do you still have these kind of things that one is more secure than the other? I think the situation has changed in the way that the threats on different platforms take different forms. So on Windows, it's very much still about malware. I mean, the malware the, or viruses, the amount of malware is still growing exponentially. You don't see that, for example, on the iPhone. On the iPhone, it's different. The main threats on the iPhone are really around network-based threats. So it's not the device itself that would be in danger. It's more the, the data that flows over the network. So talk about, for example, social engineering attacks, which means like all sorts of phishing and all sorts of kind of uh, fake apps, things that 
people don't necessarily understand what's happening but are somehow tricked into doing something that they, are, they normally wouldn't do. And then the network, I mean, I mentioned hotspots. Mm -hmm. Hotspot is a problem that is basically kind of um, platform independent. So it affects you on any platform, no matter what, what, what you do. Mm -hmm. IoT, how is the secu security market coping with that nowadays? Mm -hmm. So for consumer use, uh, most of the IoT devices are in the household. If you think about it, five years ago, uh, typical home had maybe one PC, two PCs connected to the internet, maybe a printer, mm -hmm. and that was it. Today, people have dozens of devices connected to the internet. It's, I mean, it's the obvious computers are still there. Of course, also the smartphones and mm -hmm. the tablets. But besides that, you've got home network, home entertainment systems. You've got gaming consoles. You've got, you've got things like, yeah, but we have, we have baby monitors. Yeah. You've got I, uh, the security cameras. You've got smart bulbs in, uh -huh. in lights. You've got smart home, etc. thermostats. And so all of this is connected to the internet, typically through a device called the router. So uh, the router has become kind of this central unit at home, mm -hmm. which is used to connect the, all those devices to the internet. And pe most people don't really realize that the router is something that is really a, like a key component of their networking infrastructure. It's a, it's a, it's a little box that they get from, from their ISP, for example, or their uh, network operator and that's somewhere hidden in the closet. They don't know what it's doing, but it has to be there in order to get to the internet. The problem here is that the routers are really, our studies show that the routers are typically riddled with security issues. Mm -hmm. The security situation in the router market is kind of comparable to what Windows was maybe 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got binary vulnerabilities there. You've got very weak passwords. You've got access to the administrative interface from the internet, weak passwords to that. Impro I mean, improperly configured Wi-Fi settings and all of that. So it's a big problem, big problem that is being misused by the bad guys. Mm -hmm. Like you may remember, for example, last year there was this big news on the uh, play Sony PlayStation mm -hmm. and Xbox yeah. networks being taken down for, for extended periods of time. And it turned out that the, the actual tools that the hackers used to, to attack those networks were uh, like a botnet made of home routers. So they actually attacked thousands and thousands of home routers around the world, and they used this kind of computing power and this connectivity power to do a like a distributed denial of service on, on these networks. So mm -hmm. it's happening in the wild. And the good thing is that we've got a cure for that. In our product, uh, um, since last year, our PC product, but now even the mobile product, Mm -hmm. is able to scan the home router for vulnerabilities and guide the user through ways on how to fix that. Connected car. Should, should people be afraid of riding a self-driving car? I think they should for the time <laughs> being, but the thing is uh, with cars, the situation is kind of fragmented. So it feels to me that every, each and every company is kind of trying to create their own standards. You have a fragmented space. Of course, you've got Tesla with kind of mm -hmm. all the innovation around not just kind of the, the uh, electronic systems, but also the, the actual kind of engine. Mm -hmm. But then you've got the, all, the, all the big other uh, players trying to build something I mean, on their own. And it's, it's quite difficult to kind of, uh, I think over time we will uh, we'll get to a stage where these things will be much more standardized. Um, you've probably seen the, the news on the Jeep car, which was yeah. kind of hacked into, yeah. and it was, it was, it was quite a, like a, like a big issue. But I think the issues go way beyond that. Like, for example, we did a, a recent study on Nissan cars, mm. and Nissan cars now come with an app that you can use to kind of do some kind of controlling of the, of the app, uh, of the car. But it's, it's not like you would be able to drive the car, you would be able to kind of change the direction or kind of influence the braking system, et cetera. Mm -hmm. It's more that it would send some statistics, you would be able to do some data analytics on your car, et cetera. The problem with that is that those apps seem to be written in a very kind of poor way. So th they actually introduce some new privacy and security mm -hmm. issues to the device. Like for example, the Nissan app specifically, we found that it's sending all sorts of kind of information from the device in an un unencrypted form. So it would be basically leaking all sorts of uh, kind of information from the phone. Like if you connect through an unsecure Wi-Fi, anyone can capture it and it just, I mean, creates just new security hole on the device. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a, 
it's a kind of nascent market for everyone. Uh, and the, the, I think the, the, I mean, the companies that are in the traditional space, like cars, are now trying to catch up with technology, mm. but are not doing you know, in a very kind of sophisticated or standardized way. So I think there'll be a lot of kind of uh, trial and error problems before we get to the stage where these things get fixed. And what do you see as the new trends for the future, like cars, IoT, and how to cope with all these things? Well, you just said a little bit about that, but yeah. so generally? Yeah, but, but with IoT, I'm actually more concerned about the kind of industrial side of mm -hmm. IoT. So I, mean, I was talking about IoT at homes or for consumers, but IoT, I think, is even bigger in, like, for example, manufacturing. So all those robots that, that mm -hmm. work in factories, uh, they become much more vulnerable because, uh, I mean, there's an obvious, they become an obvious target for attackers, mm -hmm. like it just m brings monetary value to the attackers to kind of somehow influence those robots. And the robots start to be kind of communicating with each other with M2M channels. And these things, I think, are just kind of totally unsecure today. And no one who's creating these uh, these standards and these new kind of technologies is building uh, security into the standards. So that's a big issue and I think we'll have to kind of go through a lot of issues before uh, those standards will actually take into account the security principles and will fix, fix those problems. Okay. Andre, so thank you very much for coming here and talking to us. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.